Um, hello, welcome to the first lecture of ECE 252B, the graduate course on computer arithmetic for spring 2020. Uh, my name is Behruz Parhami. Uh, I'm the instructor for this course, and I've been teaching this course uh, for a long time. I joined UCSB in 1988, so I've been with the school for nearly 32 years. And before that, I taught courses at other institutions for 15 years. So in total, I've been teaching for 47 years. Uh, this is uh, computer arithmetic is one of my research specialties. And I've written a textbook, uh, which will be our textbook for this course. Uh, the textbook is called Computer Arithmetic, Algorithms and Hardware Designs, uh, published by Oxford University Press. Uh, you need to get the second edition of that book uh, that was published in 2010. And the second edition is quite different from the first one. It has a lot of extra material. A lot of errors have been corrected in it. And most importantly, it has additional problems at the end of the chapter. So when I assign homework to you, uh, some problems may not exist in the first edition. And some problems, a few problems will have different numbers in the first edition. So to avoid confusion and make, make, to make sure that you have the required material, please get the second edition of the textbook, 2010. Now, in this course, we will be dealing with two websites, as I said in my introductory video. There's a website for the course, and there's a website for the textbook. Uh, the website for the course contains a schedule of lectures, uh, announcements about the course, and basically everything you need to know about the course. Uh, the textbook website has uh, uh, PowerPoint and PDF files of these lecture slides that I will show you uh, in the course. So today we are going to uh, uh, start lecture one, just chapter three in the textbook. Chapters one and two you should read on your own. Uh, they contain material that you should know from your previous uh, courses uh, in computer engineering. If there's anything there that you don't know, uh, please feel free to ask me questions. And for questions, you can either send me email if it's a quick question requiring a short answer, or see me during my office hours. Uh, I'm keeping my office hours, in-person office hours, so that we can have at least some minimal contact uh, in the real world, world rather than the virtual world. Uh, my office hours are Monday 3 to 4 and Wednesday 3 to 5. Okay, I will show you a few slides from chapters 1 and 2, the ones I consider the most important, to make sure that we have all the requisite knowledge to pursue the subsequent chapters. Uh, so I'm going to be referring to the material by slide number in the presentation. Uh, so the presentation dated March 2020, updated in March 2020, is the one you should use. So the first slide that I'm going to show you is slide number 14. So let me go to that slide. If 
I can get the cursor to work. Yeah, please excuse any problems and rough edges because I'm getting used to this mode of presentations, so not everything will be very smooth at the beginning. In fact, not smooth at all. I'm experiencing some problems placing the cursor on the slideshow in order to advance the slide. So let me see. Okay, it's not working. So slide 14 is the first one that I'm going to show you. In this slide 14, you see that we are representing numbers using four bits. So it's a toy example to just show you that we can use the four bits that are available to us in different ways to represent numbers. And each of these ways or representation methods has properties that distinguish uh, it from the other ways. So at the very top of the slide, you see the four bit unsigned integer format. So if you use the four bits as uh, for unsigned integers, you will be representing the numbers 0 through 15. Those are the red dots that you see there. So basically, the four bits give you 16 tokens or representations. And you can assign those tokens to values as you please. So you assign one token to represent 0, one token to represent 1, and so on. Of course, you want to make the assignment in such a way that you can easily do arithmetic algorithms on the representation. So you don't want to assign tokens to values randomly. But in this case, the best thing to do is to use the binary representation of the value, the 4-bit binary representation. So 0 will be 0, 0, 0, 0, 4 zeros. Uh, let's say 4 will be 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. So here, at the top of this slide, I've used my 16 tokens or representations for representing numbers 0, integers 0 through 15. The second row in the slide, uh, I've used one of the four bits to represent the sign of the number, plus or minus, and three bits to represent the magnitude of the number. And therefore, I can represent integers from negative 7 to positive 7, with 0 having two representations, plus 0 and minus 0. So I've now used my 16 tokens to represent 15 different values. One value has two representations. So this choice of representation has affected the range of values that I can represent from negative 7 to 7 as opposed to 0 to 15 in the, in the top example. But the precision remains the same. I'm still representing integer, the space integers. Spacing between consecutive values is 1 in both cases. Now, the third example from above, you see I've used the 4 bits to represent a number with a radix point or binary point. And that's the triangle that you see. So radix point or binary point. So this, this is it right here. So I have three whole bits and one fractional bit. This will allow me to represent values. And these, these are unsigned values. There is no sign. So from 0 to 7.5. 
values from 0 to 7.5 are represented. So there are 16 values represented. The spacing between values is 0.5. So this representation has more precision than the very top one with red dots. It still represents 16 values, but the range has shrunk from 0 to 15 to 0 to 7.5. So smaller range, but more precision. Okay, now if I use uh, the radix point over here in the fourth example, and assign one bit to the sign, I can represent values from negative 0.111 and 0.111 is 7 eighths. So from negative 7 eighths over here to positive 7 eighths. So these are fractional numbers. All numbers are less than 1. From negative 7, 8 to positive 7, 8. And again, 0 has two representations. Again, I've traded off range for precision. The range is now much smaller from negative 7, 8 to positive 7, 8. But the precision is much more. The spacing of these circles that you see here is 1 8. The difference between two consecutive codes or values represented is uh, 1 8. So I have more precision but smaller range. And the next one, the fifth one from the top, this one, has also its radix point in the same place as the previous example. But this uses the two's complement format to represent numbers. And in the two's complement format, we don't have two representations of zero as before, but there are 16 different representations. But the range is slightly asymmetric. The range goes from, instead of negative 7, 8 to positive 7, 8 in the previous example, it goes from negative 1 to positive 7, 8. So negative 1 is represented as a 1 in this position and 0 in the other three positions. So this is negative 1. Now if I change this 0 to 1, this becomes negative 7, 8 and so on. Uh, the next to the last example is a tiny floating point number representation system with a 2-bit exponent. And the 2-bit exponent, uh, we assume that has one of these four values shown here, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 1, using some encoding. And is significant, and the significant is one of these four values, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And collectively, the exponent and significant represent the number s times to the power e. So for example, if the significant is 2, one of the possible values, and the exponent is, let's say, 1. The number being represented is 4. OK, so that's this number. So here we have a bunch of numbers represented with this in this format. Some numbers have multiple representations. So for example, 0 has four different representations. Some numbers have two representations. Others have a unique single representation. Now here, 
the nice thing about floating point format, ignoring now this redundancy that I have, that some values have duplicate representations. We can remove this by proper choice of the format. The nice thing about floating point format is that it has greater precision, smaller spacing of the values for small numbers and less precision for larger numbers. And this is exactly uh, what we want because we really don't care for high precision if numbers are quite large. Uh, a good example of this is that if you are dealing with the budgets for a state or a country, the numbers are huge. You know, each item can be in hundreds of thousands or million dollar range. And for such numbers, you really don't need to specify all the bits all the way to a dollar and cents. But rather, you uh, are satisfied. You know, you say the budget is one point for this particular activity is one point two million dollars. Okay, so you you don't care about all the digits beyond the point two. So, to summarize, the uh, positive property of the floating point representation is that it can have a wide range and it had, can have high precision when high precision is needed for smaller numbers. And it has lower precision for larger numbers and that's what allows it to have a wider range than other representations. And finally, the last example uh, on the slide is the logarithmic number representation. And the logarithmic number representation, basically, instead of representing the number, it represents its log as a 4-bit number. So instead of representing x, we represent the log of x. And this is how the values are distributed in the logarithmic number system. It has some of the advantages of floating point in the sense that it gives you a wide range and also high precision where you need it most for small values. In fact, it has some properties that are much better than floating point. Unfortunately, some arithmetic operations are rather difficult We'll talk about this later in the course. So it has not become the standard application, standard uh, representation in computer systems, although there are some special purpose applications that do use this logarithmic number representation. Floating point is basically the standard way of representing real numbers in computers. Okay, I spent too much time probably on this one slide, so let me proceed to slide number 22. In this slide, I introduce the concept of dot notation. Dot notation is a tool we use to represent arithmetic algorithms, numbers and arithmetic algorithms on them. So on the left side of this slide, you see an addition operation. Two four-bit numbers are being added, and the five-bit sum is obtained. So this notation allows me to sort of ignore bit values. I'm not really interested in bit values, but rather the bit positions and the relationships. So I'm saying here that each of the numbers have four bits, position zero, position one, position two, 
position 3. And the sum has 5 bits. It also has position 4. So the sum is either a 5-bit number or it's a 4-bit number with a carry out. Okay, on the right side of the diagram, you see the multiplication process of two four bit numbers. Again, we have two four bit numbers, each of them having bits in positions 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then these partial products are obtained. So the first partial product here, this one, is the product of this bit and this number at the top. The second number is the product of the second bit and that number. And then we sum these to get the 8-bit product. So the product has bits in position 0, 1, 2, 3, and also the extra positions. So it's double width with this double the operands. So this basically shows the multiplication process and what happens to bits through that process. This is known as dot notation and we use it extensively throughout this course. The next slide I want to show you is slide 36. that shows a two's complement adder. A two's complement adder is just an ordinary binary adder at the bottom. And a controlled complementation circuit. Controlled means there's a control bit that says whether or not we complement Y. If this bit is zero, we don't complement Y. So Y goes to the second input of the adder, so we do addition. So if this control signal is zero, the circuit will do addition for us. If the control signal is one, we are doing subtraction. In order to do subtraction, this signal will choose the complement of Y and input it to the adder. But two's complementation requires that one be added to the bitwise complement of Y. So we take the bitwise complement of Y, put it at, uh, use it as the second input of the adder, and then we also insert a one. So if this signal is one, a carry in is also inserted. So if this signal is one, this control signal will be 1, and this carry in will be 1. So we choose the complement of 1 and use this carry in to add the 1 that is needed for 2's complementation. So this diagram basically shows the main reason we use 2's complement arithmetic in computers. Predominantly, you know, almost all computers use 2's complement. Because addition and subtraction are performed by a simple circuit that is basically an adder with a little bit of extra logic to allow us to complement Y. By contrast, if you go to the next slide, this would be an adder for sign and magnitude representation. So if X and Y are numbers that are represented by their magnitude and their signs, so these are the sine bits, sine of x, sine of y. You need a much more complicated circuit to be able to do both addition and subtraction. So this is here the control signal for add or subtract. And then the circuit has an adder, but complementation circuit here, complementation circuit here an extra logic in the control to decide how to handle these various things. Okay, the next slide I want to show you is slide number 39. 
This is one of the properties of two's complement representation that you may already know, but because it's so important, let me go over it. Okay, so suppose x, this value x here, is given to you as a two's complement number. So 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. It's an 8-bit two's complement number. So from the property of two's complement numbers, because this number starts with 1, it's a negative number. In order to figure out what number it represents, what negative number is being represented, okay, one way would be to basically complement this. So find the two's complement of that number which is negative x. So basically, invert all the bits and then add 1 to the number. So this is the complement of the number, which is negative x. Now, negative x is a positive number because x was negative. So this positive number here can be evaluated as we normally evaluate binary numbers. Multiply each bit by, the, by its weight. 0 times 2 to the 0, 1 times 2 to the 1, 0 times 2 to the 2, and it's 90. So because negative x is 90, therefore x must have been negative 90. Okay? So in order to find the magnitude of a two's complement number, uh, one way would be to complement it to make it into a positive number find the magnitude of that positive number, and then just change the sign. However, there is this neat direct method for evaluating that comes very handy in designing arithmetic algorithms. So here it is. Take this number as a binary number and just evaluate it as usual. 0 times 2 to the 0 plus 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 1 times 2 to the 2 plus 0 times 2 to the 3 all the way to here, 0 times 2 to the 6. In the next step, instead of saying 1 times 2 to the 7, you say 1 times negative 2 to the 7. And then if you add these values, you get the correct magnitude of this number, negative 90. In other words, you can view a two's complement number as having positively weighted bits in all positions except in the sign position where the bit is negatively weighted. So this one in an ordinary unsigned uh, number would be 128. In a two's complement number, it is negative 128. When you add these values, you get the correct magnitude of the number. So this is something you should be comfortable with and know because we use it in certain arithmetic algorithms. The next one after this is slide number 39. Oh, sorry, not thir 39 already covered, 42. And this is called extended dot notation, where these black dots are regular dots as we had in ordinary dot notation. These white dots, white circles, are negatively weighted. So this first example here is an unsigned number because all the bits are positively weighted. This number here is a representation of a two's complement number with positive bits in all positions except in the signed position where it's negative. And this example is a negative radix number system. So this is bit times 2 to the 0. Uh, neg sorry, negative radix. Uh, radix is negative 2. So negative 2 to the 0. Negative 2 to the 1 is negative 2. So this bit essentially has a negative weight. Negative 2 to the power 2. Negative 2 to the power 3. So in odd-numbered positions, the bits are really negative. 
And in even numbered position 0 to 4, the bits are positive. So this is a representation of numbers in radix minus 2, negative radix. OK, after this one, the last review slide, so slide 43, that shows these uh, negative bits or extended dot notation in action uh, during arithmetic operations. So here is addition of two two's complement numbers, four bit numbers. Notice that in sign position here, bits are negative. The sum of two four bit two's complement numbers is a five bit two's complement number, where the sign bit is now here. Okay, so if both of these numbers, for example, are negative, so you have this bit is 1 and this bit is 1, then this bit will be 1, the sum will be negative as well. If one of these bits is 1, the other one is 0, depends on the magnitude of the number. So if the negative number has a larger magnitude, the result will be negative. If the positive number has a larger magnitude, the result will be positive. And the way this will happen is that if the result is negative, you will get 1, 0, perhaps. Yeah. OK? You, or you may get 1, 1. OK, so let's start our main discussion uh, for today's lecture which is redundant number systems. Now, one of the challenges in designing arithmetic circuits that has been with us since the early days of digital computers is the carry problem. Okay, when you add, let's say, two decimal, most of my examples in this chapter are decimal because they're easier to understand. But the concepts apply to any radix, including radix 2. So if you have two decimal numbers, let's say this one, 578,249 and 629,389. When you add these two numbers, carries propagate, in the worst case, all the way from the right edge of the numbers to the other end. So that's basically what makes the latency of addition quite large for large numbers because in the circuit implementing this addition, the signals propagate a long way through many logic levels. So when you add these, 9 plus 9 is 18. The normal way of adding is we say, OK, 18. So we write 8 carry 1. 1 plus 4 plus 8 is 13, so you write 3, carry 1. In the worst case, this carry will affect the sum in the final position. Now imagine doing this. Instead of propagating carries, I just add the digits and write down the sum in that position. 9 plus 9 is 18. 4 plus 8 is 12. 2 plus 3 is 5. So I'm adding positions independently with no propagation between them. Of course, 18 or 12 in this example are not valid decimal digits. So this sum that I've obtained here is not a conventional decimal number that I can use. But the value of this number is the correct sum. Okay, what is the value of this number? Is 18 plus 12 times 10 plus 5 times 100 plus 17 times 1000 and so on. Okay, so I've eliminated carry propagation by just adding values in the same position without allowing it to affect the next position. OK, so how do I deal with the fact that this digit, 18, is not a valid digit? Well, I can say, OK, digits 
that I'm going to use for my decimal numbers, instead of going from 0 to 9, go from 0 to 18. So I redefine my decimal number representation to have digits that are redundant. So this is where the name redundant number representation comes from. So there's redundancy. Minimally, I need in decimal representation digits 0 through 9, but I'm allowing the digits to go all the way up to 18 in this representation. Okay, this is good if I just want to add two numbers, but what if once I obtain the sum, I want to add another number to it? Okay, so here, here are two numbers represented with the extended digit sets 0 through 18, one number and two numbers. If I add two such numbers, 18 plus 18 is 36, now the digit set grows, and each digit value can be from 0 to 36, and this is not of course, desirable for the digits to grow indefinitely as we add more and more values. However, I can sort of go back to this original redundant digit set by the following trick. I say, okay, here I have 36. I rewrite 36 as 16 in this position and transfer 20 units to the next position. So this 2 in the next position plus 16 in this position collectively represent 36. So I transfer 20 units from this position to this and write it as 2 because this position is worth 10 units whereas this position is worth 1 unit. Okay? I can do the same thing for 20 can say, okay, I'm going to write 10 here and transfer 1 to the next position. 10 plus 10 is 20. For this 20, I can do something different. Say I write 0 in this position and transfer 2 to the next position. Either one of those is valid. All that is important is to maintain the same numerical value. So 20 is either 20 plus 0 or is 10 plus 10. Okay, similarly for all the other positions. Now I do this in such a way that values left in this row are in the range 0 through 16. And values that appear in this row are in the range 0 through 2, 0 through 16 in this position, 0 through 2 in this position. So if I now add the values in these two rows, 16, uh, 10 plus 2 becomes 12, 0 plus 1 is 1, 16 plus 2 is 18, 11 plus 1 is 12, 7 plus 1 is 8, and then this is just 1. So this number is now the sum of those two original numbers at the top. And it also uses the same digit set. Digits range in 0 to 18. So notice here I managed to do carry-free addition. In other words, when I added 18 and 18 at the top, this addition did not influence the next position. So there was no carry propagation. When I did the rewriting in this step, I wrote 36 as 16 and 2 transferred. There is some propagation. But I don't call this propagation because it only affects the next position. This position affects the next one. This one, the next one. There's no chain reaction for something going from stage to stage and affecting every part of the summation process. 
So to avoid confusion, I don't call this carry. This is similar to carry. In other words, uh, what I've done, basically, I've carried two units. This is the carry from this position to this position. I call it transfer because these transfers do not propagate. They go from this position to the next and they're absorbed there and never affect the positions that are higher up. So this is what we mean by carry-free addition. So ideally, carry-free addition means this process. Where I add digits, oops, Let me go back. When I add digits in each position and find the sum digit in that position independently, so this is a parallel processing basically. If your number is 200 digits wide, the addition process takes the same amount of time as when it is only four digits wide because there's no interaction between. This unfortunately is impossible as I showed before. So if you have digit nine here and digit nine here, then you get 18 here, whereas you want all your digits to be in the same range. So this is what we did in the previous slide. We allowed the two digits to be added by this first box, this one, which computes what we call the position sum. So 9 plus 9, for example, would be 18. And then 18 is decomposed into an interim sum here. This is what I call the interim sum. And a transfer to the next position. And then the transfer into the next position is added to the interim sum for that position and give you the sum. So the latency through this circuit is the sum of the latencies of the first level blocks and the second level blocks, independent of how wide the numbers are. So this is what we really mean practically by carry-free addition not this one, which is impossible. And then if you look at the sum digit SI in this diagram, it depends on XI and YI and indirectly through this transfer on XI minus 1 and YI minus 1. So each sum digit is a function of four input digits. And this is another way we can implement the addition process. So to compute the sum digit SI, there's a box that looks at XI, YI, XI minus one and YI minus one, and does some com computation inside the box and it gives us SI. Okay, so this seems to be, on the surface, a better scheme because it just has one box on the critical path from input to output. But remember that that box is now more complex because it has, to, it has four inputs. This processing is based on four inputs, whereas each of these boxes here receives only two inputs. This one receives these two inputs and this one receives these two inputs, okay? So these boxes are simpler and therefore faster, but either, either approach is okay to implement addition. Okay, now generally speaking, we talk about redundant number representation. So we saw, for example, that we can do redundant decimal numbers with digits that go from 0 to 18, basically doubling the digit range. Instead of 0 to 9, it's 0 to 18. But 
natural question is that uh, do we really need that much redundancy doubling the range of digits? It turns out that we don't. So for example, you can do redundant decimal numbers with digits that go only from 0 to 11. So normally digits of decimal numbers go from 0 to 9. So this one has two extra digits, 10 and 11. So it has less redundancy. Now more generally, we call the two ends of our possible digit values negative alpha. In this case, negative alpha is 0 and beta. So we allow these to be signed in general. In, in this case, they are unsigned. But this one can be a negative number. The lower end can be a, we call it negative alpha, and the upper end beta. And then alpha plus beta plus 1, which is how many digit values we have here. So in this case, alpha 0 plus beta 11 plus 1 is 12. We have 12 digit, 12 possible digit values. Minus the absolute minimum number of digit values that we need, which is r in radix r, is called the redundancy index of the number representation. Okay, so in this example, the redundancy index is 2. And then let's see what happens when we try to add two numbers in this representation. So here are the two numbers. The first number, whose digits range from 0 to 11. This is the second number with digits ranging from 0 to 11. We add digits independently of each other to get the position sum. And the position sum goes from 0 to 22. Then we decompose each position sum into an interim sum and a transfer. So 16 becomes 6 plus 10. 21 becomes 1 plus 20. Now we keep the interim sum in 0 through 9 and transfers in 0 through 2 so that when we add these two sets the range will be 0 to 11 which is what we started with okay so again this is carry free addition because the first step there's absolutely nothing no interaction between digit positions. In the second stage, there is this minimal interaction where one position can affect the next higher position, but not beyond that. So these redundant representations are not standard representations. We, are, we don't use them uh, in our normal computation. So we have binary numbers, for example, stored in computer memory. We can fetch those binary numbers from memory, convert them to redundant representation in this box, do arithmetic operations in redundant format to take advantage of the carry-free property, makes addition faster, and then do redundant to binary conversion to obtain binary output. Okay, so there's some overhead here. There is the binary to redundant conversion. Uh, this overhead, the first overhead is often zero. Because, for example, if your digit set is from zero to 11, and the inputs come in have digits 0 through 9. Of course, 0 through 9 are valid digits here. So we don't need to do anything. 
but this redundant to binary converter is a significant overhead. So often it doesn't pay off if you just want to do one, one addition, it doesn't pay off to convert to redundant, then you know benefit from carry free addition, and then do this final conversion. It doesn't buy you anything because there's so much overhead here that it nullifies the advantage here. But if you do a whole bunch of arithmetic operations in this intermediate stage, before reconverting to non-redundant or standard representation, then uh, this buys you some advantage because you pay the overhead just once for many arithmetic operations. Okay, one of the most useful redundant representations is the stored carry sometimes called carry save representation. So stored carry representation, you see in the title of the slide, also known as carry save representation. So what, what is this representation? Let's take two binary numbers shown at the top here, first binary number, second binary number and add them the same way we did before without any carries. So 1 plus 0 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, and so on. 1 plus 1 is 2. So this number is called a carry save number. It's basically a radix 2 number whose digits range from 0 to 2. A digit of 2 arises when you add two ones. So this is the correct representation of the sum. So this is basically 1 plus 2 plus 4, 1 times 4, plus 2 times 8, plus 1 times 16. And if you add those up, you see that that's the correct sum. If I add the third number now, shown here, to that sum, So this is my third number, third binary number. Then again, I go 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 0, 2 plus 1 is 3. Now with this third addition, the range of digits goes from 0 to 3. But this is still the correct sum of the three numbers. This is 2 times 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 2 times 4 plus 3 times 8 and so on. Now I can do something interesting here. I take these digits that go from 0 to 3. So basically these are 2-bit numbers. And decompose them into 2 bits. So 2 is 1, 0 in binary. 1 is 0, 1. 3 here is 1, 1. And then if I add these two values, these two numbers, two binary numbers, I get another carry save number or stored carry number. Okay, so I can take a carry save number add a binary number to it and obtain a carry save number without any carry propagation. So the process shown here is a carry save number added to a binary number to yield a carry save number. And all of this without carry propagation. We started with the carry save number here. This carry save number. I added a binary number. Oh, sorry, I should have started here. A carry save number 
on this row, a binary number, I got a carry safe number. I got uh, not a carry safe number, but something with, which can also have a digit 3. Okay. In order to get rid of digit value 3, I do this decomposition to get back to a format whose digits only go up to 2. And there's no carry propagation. There's this one transfer, one position transfer. But if this, these numbers had even 1,000 bits, okay, I still would have just one position transfer. There won't be a ripple carry effect to slow things down. Okay, so this is called carry save addition. So a carry save adder is nothing but a bunch of full adders. Okay, so a carry save number whose digits go up to 2 can be represented by two bits, x and y. So this is a carry save number. Because everything in the computer eventually has to be encoded in binary. We use binary circuits. So this, this is a three-valued digit set. Here is an encoding of that digit set. 0 represented as 0, 0. 2 represented as 1, 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2. And 1, we have a choice of two representations, 0, 1, or 1, 0. So a carry save number can be encoded as two binary numbers. Here is a third binary number coming in. This is a full adder that computes the sum bit and the carry out. And then I group the sum bit with the carry or transfer actually coming from the previous position. So basically I take a regular binary adder and instead of connecting carries into a chain, I use the carries to accommodate this third input. And then I get the output here. So the latency of a carry save adder is just the latency through a binary full adder, regardless of how wide the numbers are. And this is the same thing in dot notation. This is a carry save input here, encoded as two binary numbers. This is a binary number, the third binary number in the previous discussion. And then I add these three bits and compute the sum and the carry. I add these three bits in a full adder, compute these two, and so on. And then this is my carry save result. And this is the carry out from the process because basically when you add these numbers, the result may not be representable with the same number of bits. So you have this carry out or overflow. Okay. I'm going to skip some slides. I'll let you read these on your own. So this is basically a classification of positional number representation system systems that I developed in a 1990 paper in IEEE Transactions on Computers, which discussed these general redundant number systems. That's one of the references at the end of the chapter. A paper of mine in IEEE Transactions on Computers, 1990. So radix R positional representations are divided into non-redundant, redundancy index 0, and redundant, redundancy index at least 1. Okay, going through this redundant branch, 
we divide all the representation into those that have a redundancy index of 1, which is the minimal redundancy, and redundancy index of at least 2. So redundancy index of 1, for example, is stored carry representation. And then for the special case of radix 2, we call that binary stored carry. And in each of these cases, we can have symmetric digit sets and non-symmetric. So a symmetric digit set is something like a digit set that goes, for example, from negative 2 negative 1 0 1 and 2 this is symmetric because it goes from negative 2 to 2 on the other side an example of a non-symmetric digit set could be negative 1 0, 1, 2, and 3, for example. So the digit set is non-symmetric because it goes from negative 1 to 3. Anyway, so this goes down all the known Positional number representation systems are classified here. Remember that alpha and beta parameters must be such that alpha plus beta plus 1, that's the total number of values used for digits, must be at least equal to R. So that's one requirement. And then the redundancy index is the difference between alpha plus beta plus r, how many digit values we use, minus the minimum number of digit values that we need. Okay, so this sign digit representation is useful even when we have non-redundant. For example, if your radix is 3, sorry, If the radix is 3, the standard digit set is for radix 3 is 0, 1, and 2. Digit 0, 1, and 2 in radix 3. However, we can use in radix 3 the digit set, symmetric digit set, negative 1. 0 and 1. And this uh, symmetric representation has some nice properties that make, make it useful. Okay? So signed digit can be used for non-redundant number systems and for redundant number systems. In this chapter, of course, we are interested primarily in redundant number systems. I'm going to skip this. Okay, now redundancy has a cost, basically because each digit has more values, therefore you could potentially need four more bits to represent it. And you need more bits in your registers, you need more bits on buses when you transfer these values from one point to another. So that redundancy has a cost. Cost in storage, cost in transmission of values. So many years ago, there was this proposal to use what is known as hybrid redundancy. So remember, a carry save number system has two bits per position. So for example, one zero. This represents 
the digit 0, 1, 1 represents the digit 2, 0, 0 represents. So we are basically doubling the number of bits in our registers and doubling the number of bits in buses that need to transfer these values from one point to another. Okay, so a hybrid redundant representation uses redundancy only in some of the positions, not all of them. So this position is a regular binary position, this one. This one is a regular binary position. This one is a binary sign digit position, is a three-valued position, negative one, zero, or one. Again, two binary positions and a binary. So this is periodic. So this means that the redundancy in terms of number of bits is reduced. So you have one bit in this position, one bit in this position, two bits in this one. One, one, two. So the redundancy is less. So the question is, OK, what happens to the carry free property if I use this hybrid representation. It turns out that the carry free property now becomes what we call a limited carry property. In other words, carries do propagate potentially across these non redundant positions. So if you look in these positions, 1 plus 1 is 2. But this position is non-redundant, so I can't put 2 there. I have to propagate the carry. So I put 0 here, propagate the carry. Then here also 0, propagate the carry. So carries do propagate across these non-redundant positions, but they stop at redundant positions. Therefore, no matter how wide this number is, carry propagation is limited to the spacing between these redundant positions. OK, that's all I want to say about these hybrid representations. So it's a compromise between non-redundant representation and fully redundant representation. It buys you efficiency in storage and transmission, but also it has more latency than a fully redundant representation. OK, so I'm going to skip some of the details here. So under what conditions can we do carry-free addition? Again, the same 1990 paper that I discussed formulated these conditions and proved them. You can do carry-free addition in a redundant number representation if one of these two conditions are met. Radix greater than 2 in both cases. So you have to do arithmetic in the radix greater than 2. So once your radix is greater than 2, if you have a redundancy index of at least three, then you're set. You can do carry-free addition. If you have a redundancy index of two, a little bit less redundancy, then you need these additional conditions to be able to do carry-free addition. Your alpha parameter, the lower bound in your digit set, should not be 1, and your beta parameter should not be 1. So if your redundancy index is high enough, at least 3, then you're all set. If your redundancy index is 2, then you need these two additional conditions. In particular, the inverse of those results is the following. You can't do carry-free addition in radix 2. Yeah, which is unfortunate because radix 2 is the most useful radix for computing. You can't do carry free addition if your redundancy index is only 1. 
you need at least two. And you can't do carry free addition if your redundancy index is two, but those two extra conditions are not satisfied. In other words, either alpha is equal to one or beta is equal to one. Okay, so let me give you an example. If you have radix 10 with digits that range from zero to 10. Oops. Digits that range from zero to 10. What is the redundancy index here? I have 11 different digit values, so redundancy index is 1. So I can't do carry free addition in this system. What if I use the digit set 0 through 11? This is the example that I used before. 0 through 11. Then the redundancy index is 2. So redundancy index is 2. Alpha is not equal to 1. This is alpha. And beta is not equal to 1. So this number system has the conditions for doing carry-free addition. And as we saw before, we actually were able to do carry-free addition. Now for numbers systems that where we cannot do carry free addition because they don't satisfy the requirements, all is not lost. We can do what we call limited carry addition, where transfers propagate not for just one position, but two positions. Okay, so again, let me skip this slide, uh, except uh, I'll come back to this after. So here is basically a binary sign digit addition. This is a binary sign digit number with digits going from minus one to one in radix two. This is a second binary sign digit number. Okay, the redundancy index for this number system is one because we are using three digit values in radix two. So we can't do carry free addition in this number system. It doesn't have enough redundancy. And besides, we can't do carry-free addition for radix 2 anyway, even with higher redundancy. And the problem is the following. Okay, if I look at this position, negative 1 is being added to 0, it becomes negative 1. However, I don't know whether to keep this negative one as negative one and transfer nothing to the next position or convert it to positive one and transfer negative one to the next position. Because if I keep it as negative one and the transfer of negative one happens to come in, then I'm in trouble because this cannot be absorbed here without violating the digits. If I keep one here and a transfer of one happens to come in, one plus one is two, again, I'm in trouble, okay? So the trick in doing addition in this case is sort of try to predict. Look, take a sneak peek at the next position and try to figure out whether it is possible for this position to generate a transfer of minus one. If it's possible to generate a transfer of minus one, then use this one with a transfer of minus one. If the transfer coming in can be one, then keep this negative one as it is because one plus negative one will be zero. 
and it doesn't give us any trouble. So what do we need to do is for this position to inform the next higher position whether the transfer is expected to be in the low range or in the high range. This partial information, so we, we don't know what the transfer is going to be, but we know that it's either in this range, negative one zero, or in this range. This information is enough for this position to decide how to rearrange this value, okay? So going back to the slide, this is what is happening. So position I minus one gives an estimate for the carry that will be coming in, for the transfer that will be coming in. And based on that estimate, this position can decide how to divide this interim sum into a transfer and a second interim sum in such a way that this second interim sum is guaranteed to be able to absorb the eventual transfer that comes in. And I proved again in that same paper that this scheme can be used for any number system. Okay, so for some number systems, the carry-free addition is possible. All other number systems can support this scheme. In other words, the latency is still constant independent of the width of the numbers. The latency is basically signal propagation through this box, this box, and this box, three boxes. So it's a little bit more than carry-free addition but still it's a constant independent of the width of the numbers. So this is what we basically did in this example. So the estimate that went from one position to the next one, so this position is telling this next position that the transfer I'll be giving to you is in the high range. It will be either zero or one. So it will be zero if nothing comes into this position. Okay, it could be one if a one comes in. So one plus one will be two, so a transfer of one will go. If a negative one comes in, then the negative one is absorbed, the transfer will still be zero. So this position can say with certainty that my transfer is going to be in this range, okay? On the other hand, this position can tell the next higher position that my transfer will be in the low range because it will be negative one if a negative one happens to come in. And it will be zero otherwise. So with these estimates, high or low, each position decides how to deal with. So this position knows that this transfer will be high, so it keeps negative one and transfers zero. This position knows that this transfer is going to be low. Therefore, it changes negative one to one and transfers negative one to the next position. So this one is guaranteed to absorb a low transfer. A low transfer is either zero or negative one. If it's zero, then one plus zero is zero. If it's negative one, one plus negative one is zero. Okay, so we don't get into trouble in either case. Okay, so we are almost done. I'm going to skip this section and let you read on your own. And in the next lecture, we will talk about the residue number systems, which is part of this same uh, presentation slide file, files. The files are basically for the parts of the textbook, four chapters. So each slideshow has four chapters. Uh, 
I've already put the updated uh, slides for this first part, chapters one through four, uh, on the textbook webpage. So you can download it and use it. All right, uh, thank you, and I'll see you in the next lecture dealing with residue number systems.